All right. I know it's it's not it's it's a little bit past whenever I said I know not everybody's back, but we'll go ahead and get started on things for this section. So basically what we're going to talk about today is all the things that you don't get to see whenever your veterinarian or the person that's been freezing your semen has collected your dog and then walked off into a tent or into a van and you don't know and then you just get a phone call and they say you have four breedings. So that's the kind of thing we're going to talk about. It's pretty simple. Um, so it's something that um, that you know it has been it's been done since the 70s i think um, it's probably i would say 50 50 split between technicians and technician run programs and veterinarians that are doing the process um, so just know that it's it's not something that you have to get done at your vet but there are varying levels of quality associated depending on who's doing it so we are going to um, talk about the collection process. So obviously in order to freeze the semen, we are going to collect the semen. So good to talk about, you know, how we evaluate it, what we look at, why we look at it. Um, we're gonna talk about the cryopreservation process, which means the process by which we freeze it. And then we'll talk about pellets versus straws a little bit, as well as storage uh, shipment, using it just briefly. Um, I know that could be a whole lecture in itself, obviously. Um, and then we'll also touch on a, a process called epididymal flush, which is something that you can use if your stud dog ever has something really tragic happen overnight and you don't have frozen semen on him or you are uh, desperate to save whatever you can, um, then sometimes we can help facilitate those sorts of things. All right, so usually why people are coming to me is their dog has been out on the road and it won a whole bunch of best in shows and it's been campaigned and now it's finally back and it's done and we want to bank a bunch of semen because a lot of dogs um, you know have more value once they've had those wins um, they might have um, had their health testing done you're like okay well now that we have this health testing done i really like this dog let's freeze some semen also good reasons to be freezing um, a lot of times it's these like old dog that's sitting on the couch they're like oh man you know Bodhi was like the greatest dog and he's produced some really nice kids and I just saw a bunch of his offspring his grandsons at the national and we really need more semen on him and usually this thought happens when people have their eight ten year old dogs um, coming to me I would encourage you to be thinking about the young dog so if you know you guys know your breed you're here you're at the national you're of a certain caliber to be here likely um, you know whose dog, who, what dog is going to be a superstar. You know what dog is the best dog you've ever bred. Whenever it's 12 months old, you already see that that's what this dog is going to be. Maybe he won't break the same record that your other dog did, but you know his value as a breeding dog. So we should be thinking about freezing these dogs when they're young, when they've maybe just had their health testing or when we've just um, figured out, you know, what markers they carry depending on where we are in you know, that whole charade of things. I know genetic tests come about all the time. We will have more genetic tests every year. We will have more stuff that will just confuse us as to, okay, how do we find a dog that's gonna fit all of the things that we now have to match versus just having a couple of things to kind of shop around for. I think also frozen can help. So this isn't so much a show dog thing. I would say this is more uh, like field trial labs where they'll really want to optimize one collection can be used on multiple bitches potentially. Um, so if you're trying to be practical with what you have, sometimes that works really well. Uh, or, you know, say you have some chilled shipments that you have scheduled this week, but you have somebody else who calls and says, I really want semen and I need it this week. And you say, well, I'm sorry, my dog's already booked this week and I'm, I like your bitch and I would like to breed to her. Um, so we could offer you frozen. That might be another reason why you'd have it. Um, also not, it wouldn't be dogs necessarily from England that you guys would be dealing with. Um, I would say South America would be more so. Um, I don't know if there's other areas. Do you guys also deal with um, like South Africa or mostly just South American dogs that kind of come and go? I, know, I just know because I, I see them come up to like special and that sort of thing. I don't know if there's really a lot of commingling, but I know some of the pedigrees certainly have a lot of the South, South American dogs. Um, so it might make things easier if maybe the dog, maybe your bitch was not, never came in season when that dog was being campaigned up here and you really wanted to use him and maybe that's a way for you to get semen back up to the States from him. So the ideal candidate for frozen semen is going to be a young or middle-aged dog for most dogs. There are some dogs who look great when they're older and that's wonderful if you're that person. 
But the reality is, is semen is a numbers game, and the more numbers you start with, the more likely you are to have uh, a decent number of doses to work with. Yes, sir. May I just pass this around? Sure, yeah. Everyone, this is for lunch. Jan wants everyone who's going to eat lunch up here to sign this, so if I give it to you, if you just pass it around, and then and pass it back here, then I'll pick it up, and we're going to have lunch down here in Pioneer. Okay. Good deal. So a few girls have started. So high sperm numbers are really important for math, right? So we'll talk about the math, and don't worry, I will do the math for you. This is not something where you guys have to do the math, but yes. Oh, what's that? Wow. Go ahead. Oh, so um, so I wonder if this is going to be your question. So there is a um, an idea that has been promoted that older dogs have long, I think it's longer telomeres, um, so have more propensity to have less DNA damage, less cancer, all sorts of things. That's great. And I would love to freeze your old dog, but don't come to me with a 10 year old dog and expect me to get more than half a breeding or one breeding. If your dog doesn't have a lot of good sperm left, if you waited until he was eight or 10 and there's nothing for me to freeze, then we have nothing to freeze. So there's kind of, I think it's, it's still very possible that that's true, but from a, um, economic standpoint for you as an owner, um, I would say owners get, are very happy when we say you have X number of doses and it's a high number, but they're very disappointed whenever their five-year-old French bulldog that starts with 300 million sperm has a breeding unit from a collection. Well, that's normal. You know, we, we need so much sperm to get a successful pregnancy. And I think um, some companies are breaking these breeding doses into teeny tiny amounts. Yes. Okay. So it wasn't the telomere question. No, there's no standardization. So what there's do you not. consider to be the appropriate count for a breeding unit in the Doberman? Great question. So what is the breeding unit count for a Doberman? You will get a different answer when you ask a different person. <laughs> I would say the old, the old um, average Joe veterinarians that started this would say 100 million. Right. 100 million was what we used to say, but we also used to have worse success rates than we have now. So I think that's why people have gotten better success rates is because they're starting to use more. The thing is it's hard to make the decision when you have a dead dog that has X amount of semen, do you use more? Well, I think the answer is yes, because you're more likely to get pregnancies. So if you, use, if you don't use enough and don't use enough and don't use enough, you don't end up getting a pregnancy at all versus if you got a pregnancy with, you know, with fewer attempts, but you got those bitches pregnant um, with good litter sizes, I think too. I would say in Europe, that answer might be 200 or 250. Uh, we get a lot of requests overseas for things like, like I had a, I don't know if anybody here, does anybody know Danica Banish with Tollers in here? She's a veterinary geneticist. So she has Nova Scotia duck tolling retrievers and she deals a lot with um, dogs from like kind of Scandinavia. She ships a lot of semen out there. And she had a dog that, I mean, those dogs probably produce four to 500 million sperm in an ejaculate. Maybe a really outstanding stud dog might give you a billion, but usually they're, I mean, they're smaller sized dogs. And we would send 250 post thaw um, two breedings, which is basically an entire ejaculate or an ejaculate and a half sometimes for one bitch out there. Now, they have different preferences because they have different experiences, they have different technology, they use different methods sometimes. Um, I do think that that all plays into it, uh, but we will talk a little bit about that. So we'll go into a little bit more note, but I didn't have a true, like if you come to me and you have chihuahuas, I'm gonna tell you that 100 million is probably more than sufficient, 50 million might be fine, but we don't really know, each breed behaves a little different. We don't really know. Most of the literature that's published that's across all breeds is uses 150 million as a, this is enough or this wasn't enough to compare success rates. That's where most of them are drawing the line. That's Australia has generated most of the information that we have. That is progress. So 150 million progressively modal, morphologically normal. So they actually, yeah. So most of the studies have actually multiplied all that out. So okay. we'll talk through some of that. So sorry if that went over some of y'all's heads. I know it's, it's easy to like get into some of these things as we talk, so. Okay, so, um, so we want a dog to have excellent motility, excellent morphology. The younger they are, the more likely they are to have that. Um, and there are some old dogs that 
no matter how good they look, they just don't like to freeze. So youth helps with motility, it helps with speed. I think younger dogs tend to post thaw with higher speeds just in my hands. Um, and certainly we don't want him to have any concurrent health issues if he does. Sometimes that's, it is what it is and that's why we're collecting him sometimes. But ideally we don't want him to be, have any illnesses. Um, presence of a teaser bitch will likely yield the best collection possible. So they've done studies that show, you know, just having some dog of familiarity. Sometimes it's like their best friend that's a male dog and they're just happier to be with that dog. Sometimes it's a, a teaser bitch of their breed. They're all kind of individuals. So if you know your bitch is, or you know your dog is picky to Dobermans, find a friend. If you're seeing me this weekend, find a friend that you see has a bitch walking around in panties and grab them and say, hey, you know, can we make arrangements to have a little meeting at some point this weekend? Because some, some of them are picky. So this is my, I've got a, a little old whippet bitch um, that she's 11 now. Um, she has been, she loves to go to work and she thinks stud dogs are fun and she's never been bred and she just is happy. She's just happy to be everywhere. So we can usually just dress her up. She, I mean, she cycles, she's still intact. So she cycles periodically, but we usually just dress her up with some fresh pants off of another bitch. And stud dogs don't have a clue because they smell the pants and they go, ooh, and she goes, hi, you know, she's cute. So I can tell you, um, Dr. Backus, who I think stepped, I think she stepped out to try to make arrangements for her presentation. She, um, her stud dog was really akin to whippets. There's lots of boys in Oklahoma and Texas that have decided that whippets are super cute. They are so cute. If there's one, if your dog is in best in show and that, a whippet won the group and is also in best in show. Not this whippet, but a whippet. They don't care what whippet. They don't care what color it is. They just go, oh, it's her. That's fantastic. Um, we keep, so I keep her regularly brucella tested. We require anybody who is using our bitch to test. Um, very important for you guys to be serially testing your dogs. I know this is old news. Most of you guys have known this for years, but uh, we still recommend regular testing. We still have reports of entire kennels not in your breed currently that I'm aware of, but um, I know of uh, a show kennel that was completely um, euthanized because of a brucella outbreak and they lost their whole breeding program and their you know, 20 years of work. So it just takes you know, one or two generations of us to get lazy on it and then they come back and then we get lazy again and it kind of cycles back and forth. I think we're kind of getting back into a more steady pattern where people are testing, but um, always a good idea. Paperwork wise, um, you're bringing registration forms. Um, we can skip your micro or scan your microchip. Um, usually most clinics can. Um, they should have what's called an AKC DNA profile. If you bred the dog so many times, you already have this because he has to have it. I think it's after 10 litters are registered. Um, or if he's a certain age. So if he's a certain age and he's provided a litter, then they want documentation that this really is the dog that, that produced that litter. Um, that is something that you can, you can find like the order form on AKC's website. It's really easy to order it. It's a cheek swab. You poke it in their cheek, move it around a little bit, stick it in a little um, container, and then you mail it off and they'll, they'll read it back to you for, I think for 50 bucks or something like that, right? It's always gotta have a price tag. Um, we like to have images of the dog. Um, I think it gets a little bit silly sometimes because, you know, the average person looking at a bunch of profile shots of Dobermans, will they have a clue who that dog is? No, they will not. But um, for, do for dogs that have more color patterns, sometimes it is helpful for their identification. Um, Brucella negative uh, testing within six months. So we require within six months, if you've got a test at a regular clinic and you're planning on freezing, um, it's easy to have those forwarded to whoever's doing the freezing work for you. But um, important to remember that brucella is a bacteria. Um, you want to know how we preserve bacteria so that we can use it in a laboratory setting. We freeze it. So it can be frozen in your semen. I actually am doing, currently I have a bull mastiff bitch that I was offered some really special frozen semen from the 90s and I am terrified to use it even though he was fertile. Um, I don't know if he's a brucella negative dog and it makes me panicky because I know too much and I see the bad scenarios. Okay, so collection, this is easy. You guys probably do this yourself. Some of you guys, if you've done side-by-side -side AIs. So most of us use these plastic sleeves. You might have a vet that likes these um, latex ones. 
If you use the latex ones, um, latex can have a weird reaction with semen. So some dogs, when they're collected in latex, might just have dead sperm um, because they don't like latex. But most people that I know that use this love them. They just aren't disposable. So you have to clean them and it's a chore. And it's rare that you have a dog that actually has that reaction. I've seen it once before. Um, this is the conical tube method. I think it is totally a pain. Anybody use these? I should, I should have asked that before I said that, right? Um, basically, you're supposed to like brace this against your hand. I don't know how to explain it, but you basically like hold the dog's penis while he's thrusting around a Doberman with his like, you know, they're, they're not shy about their movements. And you try to keep your hand at a distance away from the penis, but these are hard. These are plastic. They're not, they don't give. So like he could thrust and like one of these little edges could make him bleed and then you have blood in your sample and it's just a mess. I, have a, I had a mentor that was obsessed with them and he freaked out if we didn't have some sterile because he didn't want to use these. But he liked these because you could fractionate it really easily and you can, that's, I mean, that's the nice thing about it. You switch the cones in between. So first fraction, which is clear, when he's thrusting is gonna be in one, the next one is gonna be sperm rich and then the next one is gonna be back to the prostatic clear fraction again. Just so you know, there are other weird things you can do. Well, one, one's not so weird. So lutealized injections, um, some veterinarians will use to improve libido. Um, I think it takes a special scenario in case. Usually we just encourage them to like have more training, have a different bitch. I'm not a big fan of using it unless I have to. If that dog is totally, sometimes it's like a totally under-socialized, um, like a guardian dog or some uh, guardian uh, flock guardian type dog and they're never going to come into the clinic and want me to touch them um, some of those dogs we can kind of get them over the edge and get them to get an erection with that uh, catheterization this is basically the same thing we use for cats so if anybody ever wanted more bar trivia um, you collect cats under anesthesia with a tomcat catheter um, and certain drugs and then they will release an eject a very small concentrated ejaculate and then we dilute it and we use it for AI. You could do that with dogs. Um, if you had, again, it had like a special case where you couldn't do it awake. Um, same thing with electro ejaculation. So this is actually a human um, technology, but it basically overrides the brain. So you're, they're asleep. It's a spinal reflex. So you stimulate the spinal tract kind of in the area where the prostatic nerve endings would kind of go and then that will stimulate them to ejaculate. Also used for cats. Um, most practitioners don't have this. Uh, I don't actually know where I would send you to have it done. Uh, we did a few in California, but it was usually like a dog with a brain tumor or something like that where they didn't have the mentation to go through ejaculating. So we had to do something creative to get it. Now, should we be collecting semen on the 10 year old dog with a brain tumor? Why didn't you collect your dog that won the breed at the garden five times when he was three years old? Lots of questions. Yeah, lots of questions. Um, last thing is uh, epididymal flush. So it is possible, we'll talk a little bit about this at the end, to retrieve a sample by dissecting out the part of the testicle where the sperm would have been housed before that was ejaculated. This would be after neuter or after death, potentially. Um, and this has been it's not published um, to have been effective in dogs. It's very commonly practiced in horses. Um, I have had one successful litter with semen that I collected, froze, and then used on a bitch down the line. Um, we just don't have, we haven't been doing it long enough to have much of a number. So I don't know, we don't really know exactly how to use the technology 100% yet. All right. So evaluation, so this is what a normal ejaculate, the fraction should look like. So the first one should be clear, clear. Second one should be cloudy, kind of look like milk, maybe cream if the dog's super concentrated. And then the last fraction should be clear. This is another dog's ejaculate. Uh, this is the first part that we got. And then he went to kind of a lighter color and then lighter, and then he kind of did something else over here. Um, this dog has prostate disease, so um, you guys might be familiar with this if you have, if you've had this breed for a long time. They are, I would say, top three breeds to get this problem. Very easily managed with uh, medications, um, and that's, again, a whole presentation on its own. Um, but I think, uh, I think, you know, there's, there's not really much purpose. If we collect your dog and this is what his semen looks like, 
probably not going to be something that we're going to want to move forward with, regardless of how good the quality looks and how many numbers there are. He's not going to freeze well if he's got a bunch of red blood cells in his ejaculus. All right, motility. Um, so most microscopes, uh, most veterinarians will look between 10 and 40 or, or owners. Uh, so if you've got a scope at home, uh, it kind of depends on what you prefer. Um, so I like 10 because I like to be able to see kind of from a bigger picture. Some people really like 40. I just think, I think everything looks high motility on 40. I think everything looks like it's moving because you're just so much closer and it just looks busier. Um, I feel like I get better perspective further away. Uh, some veterinarians will have uh, CASA systems. So these are computers that will help to analyze the sperm. And I just have a little video here to show you. But um, so the red dots on here are being picked up as sperm that are dead um, that or not moving. Potentially, they could be live and just not moving. There's some little squiggly lines which may show up better when it's moving. But um, those are the trajectories of the sperm. So this technology has a lot of use to it. Um, the thing that's unfortunate is that, so like this guy, that's being called a normal cell. See that guy that's like kind of spinning and flopping around right in there? Uh, I mean, some of these are really good. These two are stuck together. They're being counted as somebody. So it's not perfect. What's that? Yeah, right? I know, yeah, he's, he's jumping over something right there. Um, so, and like this guy's not being counted, this guy's not being counted. I mean, there's, there's flaws to the system. So the, my point with this is everyone loves the little sheets. If you have a vet that has a cassette, they love printing out those little sheets and they've got all the little charts on them and everybody gets excited. Um, do me a favor, quiz your vet if they even know what the acronyms stand for, because most people don't. I don't even know all the acronyms. Uh, I usually look at VAP, that's it, that's the velocity. Um, and it's because I studied it in a resident project. That's the only reason I know. So are we actually using all of this technology to our best interest? Probably not, but we also are relying on this for a lot of things that we need to be relying with our eyes, that we need to like look and say, do I really think that that's what that is? Because if you turn the light up and down on these cameras, um, the one at Davis that's a $70,000 machine, you could make the same sample, depending on how much you turn the light up and down, not moving it, keeping it exactly like this. It would pick up, pick up the cells different and tell you it was 60% modal or 25% modal, depending on where you had the light. Well, that's not something we can necessarily control. Um, and there were several times that I, I strongly felt that that was under, or under scoring post thoughts on some of our dogs out there. So it just, I just would be, just be careful with it and don't, if your dog's motility changed and, and you are like worried about the details, I mean, I've had reports at a hospital I used to work at recently. I had a practitioner that said on her report, she had a CASA report that said that they were 90% modal, but then her morphology said that they were 50% hairpin tails, which means they're backwards. So how could that make sense? It didn't. It was an artifact on the morphology, but it needed to be explained as to what was going on. The dog was fine. I just felt like, you know, it was kind of a funny position to be in because, you know, the computer's saying one thing and she's saying another and who's right? Usually they say the computer's right, right? Because it's objective. That's the whole thing. This is supposed to be objective and take, the, take us out of it, which I think it will improve us. I just think the technology isn't there yet. Sperm counts can be obtained a number of ways. Um, so this is the old fashioned guy up top. That's the hemocytometer, which some veterinarians will still use. We use this as a backup. This is like a, if I think the machine is wrong, that's what I use. Um, if you're really lucky, you have this down here on the left corner. Um, that is a nucleo counter. They run about $15,000 a pop. And all they do is tell you how many sperm are in that milliliter of fluid. Um, some practitioners have these. It's great if you do. Universities, a lot of them have them. Um, they, will, they will read through blood. They'll read through anything. If there's pus in the sample, if there's anything else in the sample, they will not count that as a sperm cell. The rest of these, like this guy, is going to read all those red blood cells as part of that sample. So I have to basically under count, I have to underestimate my thought on how much semen I have if, if this is the machine I use, which this is usually what I'm using. If I have a lot of blood in a sample, we're probably not freezing. But um, that's how I would tease out the correct answer. Um, CASA systems can be accurate. Again, how accurate depends on how it's picking up the cells. It's counting the cells by marking them. If it's not marking them right, then it's not counting them right either. Morphology, this one's easy. So we just look at the shapes. So we, we 
put a, dye, a special dye on the cells. There's lots of different ones that you can do. This is called an eosin nigerson dye. And it's actually, this is a black and white picture, but it's, it's purple usually. So you can see right here, that's a distal droplet. Not a big deal for this dog. Um, so not a huge uh, problem. You can also see there's a teeny tiny little hole in that one. I probably call this one vacuolated. Um, so that's gonna be an abnormal head. The rest of those guys I think look pretty normal. They're, they're pretty happy looking cells. Okay, so um, the sperm rich fraction, that's gonna be the bright white part. Um, sometimes we get that kind of segregated off and it, it's great whenever we do, cause then a lot of times we don't have to centrifuge. Um, but I'd say nine times out of 10, most dogs are not coordinated enough <laughs> and thrusting around. And I wanna make sure I included everything. So if his first fraction looks clear, usually I will just collect him into the same bag where his first fraction started, as long as it's not like excessive. Like if he had a ton of fluid in that first fraction, then I might try to change my bag in between um, to try to get as pure a sample as possible. They do like their prostatic fluid if it's normal, but if their prostatic fluid is abnormal, like if it's acidic or basic or you know something is off with it, sometimes that like fractioning can really help with the, with the process. So freeze buffer has three basic components. So most of them have egg or some kind of a fat substance like egg. Um, there are some formulas that call for coconut water now in place of egg, which is will be completely revolutionary. I'm still waiting for them to publish that um, in dogs, but we published it in horses. It's great because egg does not travel well for, well, it has a number of qualities that are an, an issue. It's every egg is different, right? Um, so that's one thing. Also eggs are a um, regulated animal product. So it makes it harder to ship it overseas. It makes it harder to move semen and harder to make it and um, manage it. Uh, coconut water is a plant product and you buy it in a can. I mean, it's, a, it's like a simple thing. Um, and anyhow, they've been, they've been subbing that out as a test and it seems to have done quite well. They've done lots of studies in mares at this point. Uh, glycerin is gonna be the main thing that protects, oh, I should say, egg, the other thing egg does, so it, it helps to protect the cells, it's lipid, but it is also um, has nutrition in it. So it's gonna have fat, which is gonna be um, positive for the for those um, uh, swimmers. Glycerin is uh, gonna be the main component that's gonna be in there to protect the cell from cryo damage, which just means like ice crystals. So it makes it less likely for ice crystals to form. Um, and then anything that's egg-based, we're expecting it to try to grow bacteria. So uh, we also include antibiotics and in almost every extender out there has antibiotics of some kind in it. Um, most countries, if we're shipping semen out to Australia, for example, they have certain antibiotics, they must be in that sample. So we can only use certain extenders to send to certain countries. Uh, additional buffers uh, can be used to adjust the concentration. So a lot of these guys like, um, this is Zoetis's product at the top. So they have the first step buffer. And then the second one is to like um, further step up the gl glycerin concentration. Now they don't tell you that because it's proprietary, right? Everything's proprietary. All these companies, they won't tell everybody what's in it. Um, but most of these products, that's what we're doing when we do two steps. We're stepping up, a, we, if we step up to the full level of glycerin, we will kill that sample because it's too much too fast. We've got to kind of like slowly step it up and slowly kind of um, get things to, to a better concentration. Um, there is a, a published formula that's my favorite. It's called Upsala. It has been very um, hard to make because the ingredients are coming in and out of um, availability. So there's a person in California that I try to have make this whenever I can. Um, if I don't have Upsala, then I like, I don't like, don't tell them. Um, I don't like the, the freeze buffers that I was trained on originally because I don't think that they perform as well. I just don't think the dogs have good post -laws. Um, I think this, um, Mo, it's mini tube of America or MOFA, um, part A, part B is what I typically use, if not Upsala, but it's a difference of like this, we might get a post of 40% and this dog might post at 80. I mean, that's twice as much outcome for you guys. And like, I can't get behind that. So I twisted, I twisted Zoetis' arm and said, I'm going to use this. And unless you change your product, I'm going to use this. And they're like, okay. <laughs> so I also, I, um, I taught Josie Ranch 
to use this to whenever they can. I don't know if they still are, but I think they try when they can to make it regularly. You it's a pain because you can't buy it. You have to make it. And the ingredients are hard to come by now. So I don't know if we'll, we'll get to have it forever, but it's great when we can. All right, so what is the best extender? That's always the question I get. Um, every dog performs differently, but honestly, dogs are pretty easy to freeze. Compared to most species, they don't have a lot of intricacy. A lot of dogs will freeze in all these extenders and be really happy. Um, I would say there's no formal studies for like comparing the buffers. You could do a freezing trial. So if your freezing vet or freezing entity wanted to freeze, like separate them into thirds and freeze them in three different extenders, because you really want to maximize your post thaws on future collections, you could do that and then say, okay, he post thawed in 70% in this one and 50% in this one and 40% in this one. So we have a winner. He likes this extender the best. We use that one going forward. You can do the same thing for chills too. So if you're shipping semen on your dog, it, if he is at all finicky, it's great to send him in what makes him look the best. All right, so now that we've diluted our sample, um, we refrigerate it. So I am not staying here at the um, conference hall area. I am staying at an Airbnb because I need a giant freezer or a fridge. That's literally why I won't be here, but you'll see me all day, so don't worry. We just won't be able to have drinks and hang around at night. So we have to wait for a while. Um, depends on the protocol. There's actually some, so like the Uppsala protocol, doesn't actually tell you, it just gives you extender components and says like, here you go. Um, but I know I've got, does anybody know Milan Hess with curly coats in Colorado? She's a, a boarded Therio person up there. So she used to, she used to go to Crufts and she, I think on the day that she, she has curly coats, so she was interested in curly coats herself, but she would freeze, she would collect semen at Crufts right before she got on her plane package up a box of semen, carry on her plane, and they go, what is that? And she goes, it's dog semen. And they go, okay. And they just let her go. <laughs> they don't want to talk about it. And then she'd go back to her practice, you know, 12, 24 hours later, process it, freeze it, and then use it in the States. So brilliant. She, she'd have like a list of five or six people that she was doing this for every time she went over to go for fun. Um, so it, they can be flexible. A lot of them have very rigid statements. Like they'll say, we want them there to be at least 90 minutes or should be three to six hours or, you know, they have a timeline, but most of them are pretty flexible. Uh, there are plenty of things to do for us though. So labeling straws is super fun. So if you have a really productive stud dog, my poor assistant Briley will be making lots of teeny tiny labels uh, for all of your straws or vials if you're freezing in pellets uh, for that that freeze facility. All right, so loading straws. Um, so for me, I'm freezing in straws and we'll talk a little bit about pellets too, so don't worry. Um, semen is drawn into straws and sealed. So there's a couple different ways to seal this, the straws. One is latex powder. So you basically cram some like powdered latex into the end of the straw after you've loaded it and then dunk it in some water. And then that latex seizes up and becomes solid. Um, the other thing that I like, I like these beads. So you just kind of pop the bead onto the end and just push it in the back. Um, people don't like the beads because when you use the semen, this has not happened to me, but you just have to be aware you need to put the bead side down because when things warm up and air expands, it is possible that bead could become a projectile and hit you in the eye. So if you're very unlucky, I'm not, I'm not saying I know anybody this has ever happened to, but I'm sure it could happen it makes sense that it could happen. Um, so with the straws, we clean them of surface, surface liquid. So, um, you know, when, when we're just drawing things up in the straws, we, we have to be mindful. There's a little bit of semen that is on the outside of the straw when you dip the end of the straw into the semen. So we just want to make sure everything's clean, everything's dry. Um, anything that's frozen is going to get frozen as water on the outside of it, which we don't want. Um, and then we arrange on a straw rack. That's what the straw rack looks like. That's actually my straw rack. And um, that's, uh, this is actually at UC Davis. This is just to show you like, they've got these little grooves so you can like set the straws on these little guys. Um, they also make machines that do all of this for you, but they're expensive and they're really made for like, if you're processing a, like a horse's sample, you might have 100 straws to do. I mean, it can be a lot, maybe more. Um, we're never doing that many. We might be doing 20, maybe 30 on a really productive dog, might have 30 straw, physical straws. That's not gonna be breedings, but you know, might have a good number of straws, but it would be like a 2 billion sperm collector kind of a dog. 
Okay, so um, sorry that just got louder. Um, so we, we freeze on liquid nitrogen vapor initially. So initially we set our little foam friend onto the nitrogen. This vapor is super cold. So when you put your hand in, like you can't leave it for very long. It gets, it, eventually if you work in vapor enough, you actually will lose the feeling in your fingertips for a period of weeks. I know that from, from my own experience. The nitrogen itself is um, like third degree burn, reverse third degree burn cold. It's, it is like puts you in the hospital cold. Um, and it is basically we take this first step, we're letting the, it come to some temperature that's a little bit lower. And then the second step of the temperature drop is to dunk in the nitrogen. So it takes like two phases, it's technically three phases because you're going from room temperature to refrigeration to vapor to nitrogen. So just for fun, um, the temperature of nitrogen is actually, liquid nitrogen is negative 320 Fahrenheit, just for the record. More bar trivia, right? Who's keeping track? So for pellets, I just pulled this off the internet to be fair. Um, this is basically the process of how you make pellets. So it's, it, you have a dry ice block and you pipette, um, which the pipettes can come like this with just like a dropper end. This is just like a simple glass pipette. Uh, some pipettes will actually be like, you can measure the amount. So like that's the, really the right way to do it so that you know that all the drops are the same size. Um, and then we go from that into goblets onto a cane and then the cane goes right into the tank. So this is a storage tank. This is what most places will store in. There are some large facilities that'll have like big, like, like a tank that's as big as me going to the wall, like huge tanks. And I still, it all boggles my mind. How do you get how do you rotate that in a way that you can get to all of it? Because it is so big. Um, this, this is just a nitrogen filling tank. So this is like this little edge here that would fill up a container of nitrogen or top off this tank. Um, that's what some people will use. I actually have a small, just like a similar size tank that's just for nitrogen holding versus having um, any semen in it. So this is what it looks like on the inside. So. These are all little cane tabs. So each one of those is a cane that goes down like that into that vat. And this is just one um, can or one canister within this tank. So this whole guy right here lives over here usually. So they'll hook this hook over here. And each one of these has this same size can canister that's sitting in all these other areas of the tank. Just think of it like a honeycomb kind of effect. And we should have this film. That film is protecting the semen in the tank from having um, damage. We keep everything down. It can be hard to read some of the cane tops and things, but um, we have to keep everything low and low and um, deep into the tank. So straws versus pellets. So this is um, what the pellets will look like if they're done really well. So you can see they're all kind of uniform in size. Um, there's no, no, nothing has been shown to say that one is better than the other. I know that's like a common question people will ask. Um, these are the species that freeze in pellets. That is the only species that do. Everything else in the world under the sea freezes in straws. So I think for continuity sake, straws make more sense from a veterinary community side of things. Um, because you know, we, we are basically freezing in straws and pellets in people, straws and pellets in goats, and straws and pellets in dogs. But these are really the only pelleted species. The main reason it is a thing in dogs is because it's easier to do at a dog show. That's the main reason why I think that kind of took off. Um, but to be fair, I don't, I don't freeze in pellets and I don't have a lot of experience in it. So I would probably ask those questions to people that do. So I like straws for consistency. Um, they come with their own little wrapper, so they're protected. Um, there's not water contamination risks as much as there are with, with the, um, the pelleted varieties. And I'll explain kind of that. I've got some little uh, arts and crafts uh, things to show you. Uh, and then uh, the semen also, I hate, I don't know if you guys have seen, the pellets coat the bag. They just coat this, they, they'll send you these whirl packs that are enormous and they, they coat the entire inside of the bag. And I just worry about like how much is actually being lost on the side of the bag. I mean, I guess it's happening either way, um, but just a thought. And again, more common, common industry wide. So anybody a math nerd in here? Anybody love geometry? Great, okay. So we're gonna do geometry really, qu really quick. Okay, so um, this is the volume of a sphere. Um, so the, if you double the radius, you end up with eight times the original volume. 
This is an actual sample of semen that I received to an analyze so that my owner could better understand how many pellets to use. Anybody want to pick which pellet we pick and which, what it means? Probably the bigger one. But, but then if we do that, then what, it, what does that do? Does that mean that we count the smaller ones? Like, how do we say if they say there's six pellets for a breeding? Okay. This is back to my question. Right. No, and that's, this is my problem with that. Now, if it's, like I said, if it looks like that, I'm very happy. That's great. But we get more that look like this. <laughs> we also get some that are like stuck to the bottom of the, the um, vial. The vials try to explode on your hands. It's great. really fun. So quality control. What, what do we do with that? Um, just know who you're using because I think it's hard. It's hard to ask. You can't ask that question, right? You can't ask them. Well, are you doing a good job? Um, it's just, yeah, it's just um, less likely. I will just say it is less likely with a with somebody that is doing pellets that has significant re reproductive clientele as a veterinarian and is using their own semen. That is the best way to know um, that you're getting good outcomes. I guess is the best way to say it. So is that what I've never heard of pellets? So is that what they're calling a vial? Yes. So what they're doing is they're putting, so in theory, they'll put for a breeding, one breeding, they're going to put the number of pellets that you need for one breeding in that vial. And then we, we're usually given some kind of extender to dilute it into, usually. Come on. Okay. All right. So um, we are also told, I don't, but you're supposed to handle anything with liquid nitrogen with these big old gloves, right? So these teeny tiny vials, you see this is a forcep. Um, good luck trying to open one of those without your bare hands. We usually try to use like paper towel or something because they will sometimes explode from the nitrogen pressure depending on if there's nitrogen in them. So um, this is my little diorama. So um, this is proper um, uh, thawing of semen. So we have, this is a water bath. The blue represents water. Um, these are straws, so the, the yellow. And then this is a bag that, you're, that you pour your pellets into. So we pour over the water into the bag and you hit the target right in the middle, right? What if you drop it? If your pellets go all over the floor, right, don't do it. But if it happens, I mean, things, things happen. These are gonna start to melt on the floor. You're gonna get the ones that are in the pellet or in the vial. Um, this one you can pick up and a lot of times it's, it's fine. If you, whoops, you're, oh, okay. Your reception is tripped, whoopsie, um, bumped into you, and some of it goes into the water, it's gone. There's no way to get it back. And if you drop the vial, there's no way to get it back. If your bag gets a leak in it, or if it accidentally gets some water into it from the side, it's, it's toast. So just to, you know, just to reiterate why I, I like the straws from that reason. You can get a leak in a straw. A straw can explode. I mean, there's, there's things that can happen to straws. It's not that, that there's no way to bust the straw, but um, I think they're a little bit easier to work with on my end. Okay, so we're gonna briefly go through um, how we would calculate doses. So this is Zach. Um, he is a young stud dog collected one billion sperm. Um, he was 90% progressively modal. Excellent, love it. So in theory, he has 900 million progressively modal sperm to work with, period, before we do any processing. But we have a billion, so we're thinking in terms of a billion. Well, we dilute him down uh, to 200 million per mil. Don't worry, I know this is a lot of math, which is five mils of volume. So 200 times five is a billion. So we've got five mils. Our straws hold half a mil. So we're gonna end up with 10 straws. Uh, 100 million is gonna be in each straw. He post thaws at 60, great. We multiply 60% times 100 million, and that's how many we have in a straw. I know that's a lot to process, and I know we don't have a lot of time. I was gonna spend a little more time on this, but we're running out, so I'm gonna kind of keep, keep on. But if you have questions about this, come find me this week, and I'd love to talk you through it individually. Can I interrupt for one second? Yeah. As soon as we're done here, there's a complimentary lunch just the next room over, and Dan said you're welcome to stay in there and eat or just grab a plate and go to the next seminar. And I'm, I'm working, we'll get through it. I only have a little bit left. So, um, so, the, so the equation goes 100 million sperm in your straw, 60% motility would be 60 million in your straw. It's really simple math. Um, it takes a little bit of getting used to. 
Um, so then how many straws do we need? Well, if we want 150 million modal sperm, it's going to take three straws. So right. 60, 120, 180. Right. It's not quite a breeding unit. Well, it's not. It's under a breeding unit. Right. So I think when you run into that scenario, you need to, so to try to educate yeah. them. You if you can't, <laughs> you can play at your own risk. Can your bitch get pregnant with 60 million sperm? Maybe. Yeah, yeah she might. She might not. <laughs> And it's really expensive. I mean, it's ex right. expensive to move this stuff. It's expensive to use I think it. That's where we're really needing help. Yeah. We're educating them. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's it's hard. Yeah. So um, so the uh, for this dog, so we used a straw or a partial straw potentially, depending on how he drew up, as. Uh, as a uh, representation of what this sample was. Same thing, we'd thaw some pellets or a pellet um, of, of your um, pelleted sample. And we have nine straws, so nine divided by three, three breedings. That is for starting from one billion sperm, good quality sperm with a decent post-thaw. How many people in this room have been told that their dog froze over two digits of sperm? They have more than 10 breedings off of one collection all the time. It's not right. It's not, there's not math to make it right. Your, your dog didn't collect 5 billion sperm. And the post thumb is usually stated on these same company's paperwork. They will state the post thaw is 85% every single time. So red flags, here we are. Our semen doses are proprietary. They are your information. They are not this company's property. That is complete bull and I will call them on it every time. It pisses me off. They will send us paperwork and tell us, we don't wanna tell you how much we sent because one breeding unit, we have derived from 50 years of our wonderful right. experience. So you don't even know. Right, so I tell owners from these types of places that state this type of thing on their paperwork, send me three for one unit. That's what I need to use. And you're, you as a stud dog owner, you were charged for 15 units. You were back charged $1,200 on your credit card, don't you know? For all these extra units that you didn't get. Just know that that is happening. It is a scam and it yeah. pisses me off. This is why I am freezing at dog shows because I'm so sick of having this conversation. It's like beating my head against a wall. And you guys all get it. I know it's, it's not the owners that, that don't know. It's just so devastating when that was all you froze because you thought you had 15 breedings on your dog. But you don't, you've got maybe four or five. And your dog semen never has an 85% post-thaw. Maybe one dog in 100. Very rare that they would actually look 85% post-thaw. They, they have to be frozen and brought back to life. They're not going to look like fresh. Right. And be aware of back charging. And be aware of shipping charges. So I would say some companies, it is easily $1,000 to move one breeding unit. And if you want to move all of your semen, they know you're moving it. And they will upcharge you a bunch of ancillary miscellaneous charges just to inconvenience you and take your money. Yeah, so it's unfortunate, but it's out there. So just be aware, talk to your friends, communicate with each other. Um, we, can, we can move on and not have to deal with these people someday. Okay, I'm gonna st skip some of this stuff. So um, we can talk at the time, um, like whenever I'm over at the, at the booth. If you guys have any questions about storage, mostly this is just about um, Genesis. So there's two places you can store um, if you do freezing with me. One is Genesis, which is in Oklahoma. Um, it can ship out wherever you need it to ship, but I, I usually recommend Zoetis if you're not from around um, Oklahoma or Texas. I think it makes more sense to freeze with Zoetis. Especially works great if you're a Zoetis associated vet um, kind of network. If your vet is already Zoetis associated, that makes it really easy. And I know that was a lot of information and a lot of time. Thank you.